Download the free PhysioTutors app now and become the best clinician you can be. Hi there, and welcome to my frozen shoulder presentation. My name is Philip Streff. I'm a physiotherapist and professor at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And I'm delighted uh, to have you here today for my online lecture on frozen shoulder. Numerous risk factors are identified as factors that influence frozen shoulder, influence the prognosis, but also risk factors for developing a frozen shoulder. And you can see them listed here in the table and it's divided in systemic factors, diabetes, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, um, but also extrinsic factors like cardiopulmonary disease, uh, cerebrovascular disease, uh, Parkinson, um, and axillary surgery, and intrinsic factors which are in the shoulder, uh, like rotator cuff tendinopathies, tears, biceps tendinopathy, uh, acromaclavicular arthritis, etc. The most important ones here are probably diabetes and thyroid uh, problems. And it is thought that about 80% of all frozen shoulder patients have one or more of these comorbidities and about 35% have even more, have even more than three of these comorbidities. So this is probably the reason why many clinicians advise for screening of frozen shoulder patients for underlying comorbidities. So first of all, your patient will have a painful, painful and limited active and passive range of motion in both elevation, elevation in sagittal plane and frontal plane, and in rotational directions. Second, this pain and limitation will be present for at least one month, and it will be reaching a plateau or getting worse. Passive external rotation with the, the arm next to the body is really important, and this has to be more than 50% of reduction of range of motion compared to the unaffected side in the idea, then it's 50% reduction of range of motion. And I would like to refer to uh, uh, the study of Miller um, uh, in 2022 in uh, Nature Primers disease, mainly characterized by the first one by pain, the second one by stiffness, and the third one by finally recovering. Sometimes they say it, it takes a pregnancy uh, and the frozen phase four to 12 months. In fact, only 40% of patients will report as fully recovered. Another 50% will say, well, I have no um, uh, functional problems, but I will still have some motion limitations, still have some, like let's say 10% of range of motion uh, limitation, but no functional issues with that. So this self-limiting issue is, as you can see, a bit under, uh, under debate. And uh, think of, uh, for instance, pain-related fear, pain catastrophizing, depression, anxiety, uh, well, they really have a proven effect on a, a negative effect on the prognosis of a frozen shoulder. So determining whether a patient has a frozen shoulder is based on first excluding possible, maybe sinister pathologies, red flags. And uh, without elaborating on that uh, too much uh, in this presentation, but think of um, irritable, high irritable rotator cuff uh, tendinopathies, calcific uh, tendinopathies of bursitis, um, arthritis, of course, advanced uh, glenohumeral osteoarthritis, uh, the locked posterior uh, glenohumeral dislocation, also uh, based on a fall or a trauma, um, maybe even humeral tumors or lung top, the pancos tumors, Parkinson's disease, cervical spine uh, associated processes, and even post immunization uh, shoulders, post COVID, uh, we saw some shoulders that looked like a frozen shoulder. But most of these um, uh, differential diagnoses can be mistaken for a frozen shoulder, and that's a lot to do with uh, the typical progressive nature of uh, the problem, the progressive painful nature, the stiffness. Um, but uh, although I'm not able to, to go into detail for all these differential diagnoses, I think the most important difference is probably that uh, these differential diagnostics, they don't have the typical passive external rotation range of motion, most of them. So that's a typical uh, difference that you can definitely use in your uh, differential uh, diagnostics. A healthy shoulder has a glenohumeral uh, joint capsule. And the glenohumeral joint capsule is a, th a thin layer of connective tissue and the joint is filled with synovial fluid um, produced by the synovium. And the synovium, which is the uh, inner thinner layer of the capsule marked in yellow on uh, this picture. This glenohumeral joint capsule uh, with its ligaments is the mostly affected structure responsible for stiffness in uh, frozen shoulders. 
The majority of connective tissue in the um, shoulder joint capsule are type 1 collagen, some elastic fibers, and they create this rigid but flexible structure, uh, giving some stability to the shoulder joint, but also a lot of mobility to the shoulder. But where does it all go wrong? Where does the pain start from? Well, it is hypothesized that the pathophysiology of frozen shoulder starts anteriorly in the region of the rotator interval, the area of the, area of the coracohumeral ligament. This might explain this external rotation deficit we, are, we so often see in, uh, in frozen shoulder patients, as the coracohumeral ligament is the one that is stretched when performing external uh, rotation. But first, let's see at uh, let's look at the uh, the pain development. Um, there is a growing acceptance for a central role of immune cells and and inflammatory cells. Uh, many researchers have underestimated the fundamental role of inflammation in driving this chronic uh, fibrotic uh, pathology. So um, various immune cells have been identified in capsular tissue, uh, including these B cells, um, macrophages, mast cells, T cells. And these immune cells have been linked to driving the progression of uh, fibrosis. But is it always capsular? Are these restriction, restrictions always capsular? And a few years ago, there was this interesting study from, from Holman, uh, which put a different light on it. So are all restrictions capsular? Well, although the glenohumeral capsule will likely play an important role, uh, Holman and colleagues showed some interesting results based on five, small, five um, uh, individuals with frozen shoulder who were scheduled for capsular uh, release surgery. And uh, <clears throat> the range of motion was measured on the day before uh, surgery. So on the day, of, sorry, on the day of surgery, but before uh, anesthesia, and again when they were under anesthesia, but before capsule release. And all five subjects, and you can see that in the pictures here. You can see on the left the before and on the right the uh, the uh, after column. All five su subjects demonstrated an increase, a large increase in range of motion, as you can see in these pictures. These find findings suggest that muscle guarding may also play an important role, may also play a significant role. But further studies, it's really warranted because still it's five patients, as I said, it's just uh, it's a case series, and uh, and you can also see that there was no scapular stabilization. Physiotherapy, what do we have? Well, we have uh, the advice, uh, besides the education, of course, we have general exercises. We want to get the patient moving. Then we also have uh, our passive and active or passive mobilizations, and we have active shoulder exercises with resistance, strength exercises, and maybe some physiotechnical options like uh, electrotherapy, TENS, or shockwave uh, therapy. So let's see what the evidence of all these four aspects is after you've done your education. First, your general exercise. And these general exercises can be done when, for instance, they are high irritable. You, can't, you cannot do that much with the shoulder. It's too painful. Uh, or just as an adjunct to local interventions because they have so, such a good effect. They have such a good effect on general health. And keep in mind, the general health is really this <coughs> metabolic issues are really a fundament for the frozen shoulder. So you might increase general health, but really have an effect on the frozen shoulder also. They will improve mood, and this is important because many of, many of them are on the edge or even over to it, towards depression or anxiety. So it will have an effect on the mood. It will have an effect on sleep. They will sleep better. It will have an effect on low-grade inflammation, which is related to the fibrotic process. It will have an effect on insulin resistance, which is associated with the development of advanced glycation end products and fibrosis. And it will have a pain-reducing effect, an exercise-induced hypoalgesia. It will reduce the pain of the shoulder. And it's just about taking a walk in, in the forest, uh, go for a ride with your bike if, if, if that's possible. Uh, maybe even go in, in, in a swimming pool without really swimming that much. But moving the shoulder, moving the body can have all these positive effects.